In this episode, I'm having a conversation with Scott Lapierre. Scott is the teaching pastor at Woodland Christian Church in Woodland, Washington. He is a speaker, an author, and he's also the father of 10 children. Yes, Scott and his wife, Katie, have 10 kids between the ages of six weeks and 17 years old. And today we're going to dive into four ways that you as a father can be a strong spiritual leader in your home, a leader that your kids can look up to a leader that can lead his wife and a leader that can build a healthy home where you become a dad making a difference. This episode of the DMD podcast with Scott Lapierre starts right now. Scott, welcome to the dad's making a difference podcast, brother. Great to have you on today. Thanks, Cam. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this uh, with you and your listeners. Well, I'm going to tell you, Scott, anytime I can talk to a dad of 10 kids (laughs) and an author of multiple books, um, I'm always eager and excited to do so. You must have such a a depth of life experience that so many fathers don't have or are very curious about. And I can't wait to dive into more about your story. Uh, So, Scott, why don't we start there? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you got into the ministry a little bit. I think that's an interesting story. Okay, great. So uh, my wife and I grew up together, Northern California. Neither of us were were Christians. I went through ROTC. I was an officer in the army, got out of the army, and then I was an elementary school teacher and coach. And that's when I became a Christian. And my wife and I reconnected after high school, found out the other had had become a Christian as well. And uh, we got married. And then my second year um, teaching was when I became a Christian. So I kept teaching, but I really wanted to be in ministry. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought I would teach and coach the rest of my life. You know, I really enjoyed it, Cam. Uh, but then once I became a Christian and I de- had this passion for ministry, I wanted to tell people to open their Bibles versus tell kids to open their English books. And then uh, there was a church looking for a part-time pastor and a part-time youth pastor. And I started at that church in California as near where, where we lived. So it was in the same town and this uh, senior pastor mentored me. And then we came to Washington in 2010. And when Katie and I got married, we had the conviction to let God be in charge of how many kids we had, you know? And so people are, yeah, regularly kind of shocked at us having 10 kids. And I'm like, look, I'm shocked we have 10 kids, you know? And so not a commentary on what everyone else has to do, but we just felt led to let God. So if someone said, did you want, you know, did you try, I hate to use this language, try to have a lot of kids. I wouldn't say it that way. I would say that we, you know, tried to have what God want us to have, or that's what we're trying still to do. So we'll see, you know, maybe that we had our 10th child in October, Katie's 42. So we, you know, been wondering for the last couple of kids that this would be the last one. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, amazing. How old are your kids? So our oldest is 17 down to what, like six, seven weeks now. I'm not sure when this will air, but yeah, October, 2023 was the, was number, was number 10. And so, yeah, they're about 18 months apart. Kind of seems like God lets the land lay fallow for a bit. And then, you know, we have, have another kids kind of how it's been pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah. Busy and exciting and a lot of mm-hmm. energy, I assume. Mm, very much so. Because I was going to say, Scott, I was like, for a guy who has 10 kids, you don't look old enough to have 10 kids. But if you're spreading them out 18 <laughs> months at a time, mm. it's yeah, I'm, for, I'm 45 for any of your, you know, anyone yeah. watching. And yeah, I got yeah. married about 20, 26, I think. So, okay. So you got married at 26. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm, man, I'm okay. I got to dwell on this a little bit. 26, you know, when someone says, hey, we've been married, we have 10 children. Uh, you think, oh man, they got married young. You know, they got their high school sweethearts. They got married at twenty. They they started having kids, but not you. You you and your wife. You met each other in high school, but then you went your separate ways, and you came back and reunited after. Got married when you're twenty six, and I want to dig into a little bit of something you just shared really quickly. You weren't a Christian in high school, what, and she wasn't either. Mm-mm. And then you separated out and you did your thing. And then you came back and you met each other. How old were you when you met each other again? Uh, we were in our, in our early twenties. And so it was kind of like, that was the interest, you know, yeah. wow. You know, Katie, Katie Maher is a Christian and she's like, wow, Scott Lapierre is a Christian. And we, we start talking. It was like, tell me how you became a Christian. Tell me what the Lord's done in your life. And, and by this point I felt pretty strongly that I, I'd be a pastor someday. I also had the yeah. conviction to homeschool, had the conviction to, 
you know, have, have as many kids as God want us to have. And so I'm just saying, Cam, that when you have those requirements, that takes a lot of women off the table, let's say, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, Whoa. you just throw out, yeah, you just throw out homeschooling or pastor's wife and there's a lot of women running the other direction. Yeah. And so Katie and I are talking and I'm, I'm just kind of like, Hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking. And she's, this is all sounded good to her. And, and it just kind of went from there. <laughs> That's amazing. And so here you are 26, you're married, uh, every 18 months for the next 19 years, you're having, <laughs> having a kid. Uh, but through that whole experience, I could imagine that your marriage has been under times where we've had a lot of stress, ups and downs, you know, parenthood in itself. I'm a parent of two and I feel like I'm letting the team down now, man. Like I got two <laughs> kids and there's times I'm really struggling. What did it look like for you and your wife, you know, when you had your started having kids and now marriage gets into the flow, you're a pastor of a church. When did you start really getting into, if you have, into a groove or a routine where you felt confident in what you were doing? <laughs> That's a funny question, Cam. I appreciate that. Yeah, there's a lot of stress just being a husband has stress. You know, now you have a wife to care for and yeah. then you have children. Now you got children to care for. And then there's stress being a pastor. So yeah, I, I actually just sent a message today. My my associate pastor wrote me, I'm not kidding, this just happened. And he checked in on me, just said, How are you doing? And I responded, I said, I'm I'm not feeling good today. I'm filled with anxiety. There's some things going on with the church. You know, my wife came out, I have a home office. She came out to visit me, spent some, spent some time with me. And yeah, there's definitely stresses from ministry and, and at times marriage, you know, children. And so uh, Par Harvest House has been the publisher for my, for some of my books. Mm -hmm. And I believe they would be happy for me to write a parenting book. Cause I can, I think that's like, Hey, this guy's got 10 kids. He must know what he's doing. And there's really two reasons that I haven't written a parenting book. One is I'm, I haven't preached on parenting extensively and I generally yeah. don't have the bandwidth to write separately from my preaching ministry. So if you see one of my books, I preached on that topic, right? Cause I don't, yeah. I just don't have the energy or inclination to write separately from preaching. But the other reason I haven't read a parenting book is I'm still trying to figure this out. You know, um, our oldest is, is, uh, not even is not married and is in the later teenage years. And so I'm still learning. I'm looking up to men that are older than me that have gone before me and done a better job than me and trying to grow. And <laughs> I took my kids out the last week, actually, I wanted Katie to have a break. And so I took all the other kids, including our second youngest, who's, who's only two, we went bowling and then we went to pizza. And when we got to the, to the, um, pizza restaurant, and all the kids had the pizza. I got them all to look at me and I said, Hey, I want to have your attention. Uh, and you know, they're used to me joking around. I said, this isn't a joke. I have something serious that I God's burdened me with. And I said, I want to ask you guys to forgive me. I'm sorry that I have, I haven't been as gentle as I should be. I've been impatient. And, and so that's me. I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> telling my kids, I need Christ as much as they do. You know, daddy needs the gospel as much as, as much as all of you need the gospel. And, uh, you know, I want to grow, we're growing together here. And, I, I think that's an, you know, I appreciate your ministry to fathers. I don't think there are many more important, I, I guess if I just, if I make this brief, I have a ministry to marriages, which I'm thankful for, because I believe if we have strong marriages, we can have strong families. We have strong families. We can have strong churches. We have strong churches. We're going to have a stronger society. You know, and the inverse is also true. Weak marriages produce weak families. Weak families produce weak churches. Weak churches hurts all of society. But if I back up even a little more in that, order. If you want strong marriages, I think you need strong men. You need strong yeah. fathers and strong husbands. You want strong families. You need strong fathers and strong husbands. That's why I appreciate what you're doing, but, but being a, a strong husband or a strong father, it, it means, you know, asking for forgiveness, apologizing, being humble, telling your kids yeah. when you, you mess up. <laughs> of course, being a strong father doesn't mean having all the answers and <laughs> knowing what to do all the time. I can only imagine like, what you must feel when you stand in front of your children, you're like, Hey, I, I need your attention. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We say, no, dad needs to be honest and they need to be vulnerable with you right now. And I apologize. Like that takes a lot, but what it does, I just think of that as a learning moment and a moment of growth for your family and for your kids. How many boys do you have in your family? It's even at five and five right now. Amazing. And so, you know, you're raising young men, young men that I'm sure you want to be strong and confident and all that, but also to be vulnerable and emotional and open to 
to growth and the influence Humble, of others. transparent and all, all those things. Yeah. We, yeah. we talk about being, uh, you're not going to find someone that puts more emphasis on strong spiritual leadership in the home. I do marriage conferences across the nation and I'm talking to husbands about being strong spiritual leaders. I'm dealing with wives who, you know, the Bible talks about wives submitting to their husbands and yeah. You would almost think, cause it gets some, it gets so much criticism, the idea that wives would submit to their husbands, but I don't have women coming up to me complaining that they have to submit to their husbands. I have women coming up complaining that their husband won't lead. So the biggest, mm. the biggest desire yeah. that I hear from wives is it's not, oh, I can't believe God's word says this. This is so barbaric or chauvinistic that a husband is the head of the relationship and I'm supposed to respect him or submit to him. I don't have women complaining about that. I have women complaining saying, you know, I listen to your message about men being spiritual leaders, or I'm listening to you talk about men praying and reading the word with their family. What can I do for my husband to do that? Are you, you're even talking about why submitting and I've got why saying, I, I don't even know that I can submit because my husband won't lead enough in our home. Wow. And so the, so I'm talking to men about being spiritual leaders. I'm, and I'm hearing from wives that want men to be spiritual leaders. But when I talk about leadership, I'm not talking about being dictatorial or authoritative. It's, you know, praying, reading the word as a family. Um, you know, when you make mistakes, you don't lead just by decisions you make. You lead by the example you set, your humility, going before your family and saying, hey, I blew it here. I shouldn't have, you know, done that. I shouldn't have talked to your mom that way or um, I should have been gentler, you know, I, I spanked out of anger or whatever these mm -hmm. different, different things are that we do wrong. You just shared a couple of examples, but I want to dig into this a little bit about men being strong spiritual leaders as fathers and as husbands, man, that hits hard when women are, are coming to you and they're saying, yeah, my husband's not leading. So in those scenarios, in those types of conversations, what are some of the ways in which men can grow as leaders? Because they're not just going to like turn on a switch and be able to do it all, but grow as leaders. And what are some of the things that they can start to do right now in their family that are the first steps in becoming a strong spiritual leader in their home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Cam. And I, I appreciate being able to answer that because this is one of my one of my passions. So I'll just get a little momentum into this by pointing out that um, I didn't recognize very early how intimidating it is for many men to pray and read the word with their families. And here, here's what I mean by that. Be, we project ourselves on others. And so because it's fairly comfortable for me to do an interview like this or get up behind the pulpit and preach, I assume that's comfortable for other men. I see guys build their homes or work on cars and I'm just like super intimidated by what they do. Yeah. They look at what I do and they're intimidated by what I do. Right. I see a guy build his home and he doesn't think that much about it. And I'm like, you're like one of my heroes. I can't even, you know, fixing a gate. It'd be like a victory for me. How do you build a house? You know, how do you work on a car? <laughs> yeah. Cause we, we project our, and these guys look at me and they're like, I don't know how you do that. Get up and, you know, put a sermon together and preach that. Well, because I didn't understand for some time how difficult or intimidating it is for men to be spiritual leaders in the home. I, I learned that because I had men coming up to me at conferences. This is no joke. Men who are sincere, men who want to do what's right, men who listen to me talk about men being spiritual leaders, recognize they're not doing that, but yeah. they do want to do that. And so they come up and they're like, hey, you know, Scott, I listened to what you said. I feel like I'm failing in this area. I'm not being the spiritual leader that I should be. And, but I'm, and they'll be honest, you know, I'm afraid I'm nervous. What if I read the word with my family and I don't know what to say, or I don't know how, how to answer the questions or what if, you know, my wife laughs at me or, and in a moment, I'm guessing you have more men that listen than wives, but I'll, I'll share something for wives in a moment too. And, you know, guy, I'll say, well, a guy will come to me and he'll say, hey, I don't know how to read the word with my family. And I'm like, hey, if you know how to read, you know how to read the word with your family. And so one of the mistakes guys make is they, and I understand why this happens. They hear the Bible being taught from men like me who spent all week preparing a sermon. And so yeah. you've got fathers and husbands who are thinking, well, what if I don't sound like Pastor Bill at church or, you know, Pastor Scott putting on that marriage conference, or what if I don't sound like that guy on the radio? And so they have this un unbelievably high, unrealistic standard for what they have to do. Well, my my time in the word with my family doesn't look like my sermon on Sunday. You know, right. my sermon on Sunday, I've rehearsed that all week. My time in the Bible with my family looks like we stopped at verse 13 last week. Let's pick up at verse 14 this week. There's nothing fancy about it. I mean, with 10 kids, I've got kids that are 
don't want to pay attention or that are in the middle of something when it's time to start family worship or they're like, do we have to do that? You know, my kids aren't like, it's not like, because I'm a pastor. My kids are like, yeah, daddy. Okay. We've only been doing this two hours. Let's keep going. You know, that's not what it looks like in the LaPierre household. And so I tell guys, don't, don't, if you make it too difficult, the standard is too high you're going to be intimidated and you're probably not going to do it regularly. So it doesn't have to be any tougher than I chose this book. I mean, ideally I would tell fathers now to finally get around to answering your question. What are the things guys can do? Here's two practical things. Find a book you're enthusiastic about, because if you like it, if you're enthusiastic, your family picks up on that, you're going to enjoy it more and find a book that you have more familiarity with. You know, if you don't know Amos, don't choose Amos, right? If you feel good with the book of Matthew, you know, start with Matthew, or maybe you like narratives in the Old Testament. You like Genesis, start with Genesis and start at verse chapter one, verse one. And here's what we do. Not that every father has to do the same thing, but whatever kid is on my left, as we're all kind of sitting around, you know, they know, they know the routine by now, this kid reads whatever verse we're at. And then the next, and I say, Hey, any thoughts? I don't want to share anything. Sometimes there's no thoughts. Next kid reads the next verse. And sometimes we, you know, read together longer than other times. I mean, depends when we start, depends if it's shower night, depends if the kids, if it's already late. I mean, there's, I've had women say, how long, I never answer this. I've had women come up, how long should we be doing our family worship? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you that because you're going to go home and hammer your husband. If he's not, I'm like, you need to be thankful if your husband does 15 minutes or 10, you know, there's times where 15 minutes is a real victory if you're really busy with your family. So, and that's, that's one of the things I would tell women is they need to recognize this huge part they play in making their husband's spiritual leadership easier. Hey guys, I wanted to take a moment and talk about our community of DMD brothers in the DMD mastermind. We are men who help each other to stay focused and intentional in our pursuits of personal, professional, physical, financial, emotional, and spiritual growth. We are a community of men who bring courage, wisdom, and transparency to unfiltered conversations that challenge us to be more impactful men. To be, dad's making a difference. We do this through our online and in-person events where men come together to speak into each other's lives and then turn around and do the deep work to create change in their families, in their businesses, and in the community around them. If you are wondering if this community might be right for you, you can find more information on the DMD Mastermind, and you can also book a call directly with me at dmdmastermind.com. Now, let's get back to our show. I got invited to speak at this ladies' conference, which sounds kind of funny, but it was actually a super wonderful experience. So... That was the first thing I said. I said, I know you're looking at me and you're like, why am I, why am I here? And I said, well, you know, I was invited and I'm glad for this opportunity because what I want to do is I want to share with you something that women, the female teachers couldn't share with you. I want you to understand how I suspect many of your husbands are feeling. Hmm. Um, They're nervous. They're perhaps terrified to pray and read the word with you. They need your encouragement. They need your support. They don't need you to, you know, I don't care if your husband fumbles every word he says and can't answer any questions. You know, you look him in the eyes and thank him for being a godly man. And, and when you pray, you thank God for giving you a husband who will be a spiritual leader than like this, because you're probably in like the 0.00001% of the population that has a husband or father that'll read the word with you or with a family like this. And so be thankful and, you know, praise him to your kids. And, and when our kids like, if there's any eye rolling, like we're going to do Bible study and the kids moan or groan. I mean, Katie's the one who jumps in there and she's just like, Hey, you better knock that off. You better go get your Bible. You better be thankful for your dad. You better appreciate what he's doing for any women that hear this. That would be my encouragement is do the best you can to support your husband. Yeah. Scott, I feel like I need to be a little bit vulnerable with you because you know what you've just spoken about is where I find myself as a father. You know, I, yeah, I have a podcast that speaks to dad and challenges dads. I have a coaching program that helps dads. I work in a school where I help youth and at home. I'm yeah, we got my morning. This is actually a win for me. And this is recent. I want to share this with you. So I'm working through the Bible for the first time in a year that I have this reading plan that I'm following. And this is the first time I've ever done it. 
and I'm going through and my son gets up super early in the morning. He's always been an early riser and he'll come up to my office and it's like 5, 15 and I'm reading, I've got my cup of coffee and I'm, I'm reading the Bible. I'm making some notes and I notice that he'll start like, he'll leave and then he'll go open his Bible and he'll be at the kitchen table. And so then I was like, Hey man, what, why don't you just come sit next to me? And so he came and sit next to me and I'm just like in my head, I'm like, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to engage him in a conversation about this because then I start to go back to my own doubts of my we little backstory. I grew up in a Christian home, Christian junior high school, Christian high school, your Bible school, and then went off to university and college to play basketball. And in that period of time, there was an event in my life and my mom got very ill and I got pretty bitter. And I ended up leaving the church, not what I believe, but left the church for 15, almost 16 years. And it was my daughter when she was about four years old coming upstairs, just about four, came upstairs in a little dress on a Sunday morning, said, hey, are we going to church today? And I was like, I, I guess so. And so we started going back to church. And then from that, we, my wife Kim and I have just seen such peace and joy in our life and in our home. We have hard times. Like there's lots of stressful times, um, but it's just different. We just navigate things so much differently now that we have a relationship with God. And starting, when you talk about the guys who are terrified and they're nervous and they don't know what to say and how do I do this? But man, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Every day I'm like, okay, I want to read this with my kids. How do I approach them with this? I'm like, they're nine and 11. Just tell them to sit down and just read it with them. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I see. Hey, Cam, I just want to tell you, I super appreciate your humility. And I, I'm sure I say that on behalf of your listeners. And I think that's what men need to hear. Men don't need to hear about every father who is, you know, thinks he's got it all figured out and is perfect and great. Um, it's interesting if you're preaching, I've been told this, that if a pastor begins to share something vulnerable, I mean, you'll see people perk up. This guy was telling me this story that he's at this church and this pastor started saying something, sharing something vulnerable. And everyone was just like on the edge of their seats. And then he flipped it around and turned it into something prideful and he made, became the hero of his own story. And like everyone was just kind of like, you know, their shoulders came forward. And so I appreciate what you're saying. Guys need to hear that. Guys need to know that this is a common struggle. There's probably two things that I would I would say first. There's nothing wrong with telling our family, I don't know. I think we need to be comfortable saying, I don't know. And and I'm I understand that men are not in the position I'm in to study God's word, you know, 30 hours a week. And they, I'm not minimizing the importance of men being in the word, studying it. But if, you know, you're a mechanic, you're going to know cars, you're in construction, you're going to know houses, you're a pastor, you're going to know the word. A guy that's not a pastor can't be expected to know the Bible as well as pastors. Uh, and I get asked questions I don't know the answer to. Or I, you know, when my kids start talking to me, just the other day, one of my girls says, so God is Jesus or Jesus is God, you know, questions about the triune nature of God. These are difficult things to answer no matter how long there's mysteries, tension, no matter how long you've been a, a, a Christian. And so there's nothing wrong with telling our family, hey, I don't know. So that's one thing I want to tell fathers, just get comfortable with that. I would add to that, though, if you do tell your family that you don't know something, you probably have a responsibility, assuming it's a, a reasonable question to try to find the answer and get back to them, you know, and there's great sites. I mean, we live in a world, a time when there's so much information available at our fingertips. There's a site, gotquestions.org that I use all the time. Whatever question your kids give you, you can probably go there, look up the answer and then go back and, you know, share the answer with your, with your family. Uh, if guys come to talk to me, because you can go to the elders at your church too and get, and I'll tell a guy, I'm like, Hey, you know, go tell your family. Don't tell them you talk to pastor Scott. They don't need to think highly of me. I'd like them to look up to you. You go share this with them. And and then the second thing I would say is remember that the power is in God's word to sanctify and cleanse. And so what your family really needs to hear is not your intellect, brilliance, wisdom. They need God's, you know, that's Ephesians 5, husbands love their wives as Christ loves the church. And then the following verse says, as Christ sanctified and cleansed the church, washing it with the water of the word. And so the word is what goes out and washes over our families and accomplishes that sanctifying and cleansing work. It's not contingent on us being articulate enough or, or, or knowledgeable enough. And so if any father can be reading and the word is going out over their family, you know, whether the father's reading it or kids are going around the room reading a verse, then it's going to be accomplishing that powerful work in their mm -hmm. children's lives. And that should be a real income 
real encouragement for every father to not feel like that huge burden is, is on their shoulders. That's amazing, man. Already. So I have four things that I've written down of like <laughs> selfish. I told you this before we were going to record selfishly. I learned so much from my guests and I've learned so much from you already. I appreciate you. Praise God. Um, choose the book, find a book that you're enthusiastic about a book you're familiar with. Tell your family, I don't know, but do your best to find out. And the power is in God's word. And I think that's an important piece of this is not, this is not performance. And I think some guys feel that it needs to be performance. Uh, I know that I struggled with that for a bit. All right, everybody around the table, here we go. It can be me sitting here for a moment and being like, I have this thought. I think this is a great time. Kids, turn the TV off. We're going to sit down on Very the good. floor in the basement and just talk about this together. Very good. And so you've challenged me to do that as we enter into this uh, beautiful holiday season when we're recording this. Um, well, you know, one, one other thing I'd add just briefly yeah. to, to kind of piggyback, you were talking about your Bible reading plan, your your devotional time going through the word. I mean, there's kind of this idea that you just need to be like one day ahead of your family. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're going, whatever, what you're doing in your devotional time, if you're going through, let's stick with Matthew and you read Matthew 13 in the morning, you know, maybe that's what you do with your family in the evening. And so you're going into something you have some familiarity mm -hmm. with because you were already reading it before you started reading it with your, your family is just an idea. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I'm going to implement that. Because <laughs> I always ask myself questions about, what did I just read? What does this mean? And then I would love to hear an 11 year old's perspective on what I just read. Yeah, mm -hmm. I bet it's fascinating. Um, I don't want to get too sidetracked here because I know you've done a lot of amazing work and you spoke to this a little bit. You've alluded to this, I should say. You don't write on things that you haven't preached. And so you started, you know, preparing, you've, you've shared with us you prepare 30 or more hours a week for your sermon on a Sunday, but you were encouraged to take these notes and make it into something bigger. So can we shift gears just for a moment? I want to talk about your books, your work, and how this came to be. Okay. Well, I, if I really had to summarize it, I'd give my wife credit because she really, she would see, I guess, you know, pastors might fall into two categories. You have one category, pastors notes are very abbreviated. They have like a word or a phrase to tell, remind them what to say, you know, and they come up with a couple half sheets and just kind of glance at them. And then there's other pastors that manuscript. I mean, that's like what John MacArthur does or, and I'm in that category, not because of John MacArthur, but just because that's kind of how I've always done it. And my wife would see me just pouring my heart into these messages and refining them and polishing them and going over the notes and, she kept saying, you know, you need to turn these sermons into books. And I was already so busy. I didn't like the, sure, it'd be attractive to have a book, but it's like, I didn't need something else on my plate. So I preach on marriage at the church and Katie's like, look, this is, this has to be, you know, cause I generally go verse by verse expositionally through books of the Bible. And I did this marriage series because I saw a need to strengthen marriages, equip husbands and wives and in my own church. And so it was supposed to be like this marriage month. It ends up being like what a running joke was. It was the marriage year because we kept kind of having sermons on marriage and I was enjoying it. People seem to be in, enjoying it. I'm kind of feeling people out, you know, and yeah. you want to be led by the Lord. But at the same time, if your congregation is kind of like, Hey, how many, how, how many Sundays on marriage here, you know, but they were, they seem to be enjoying it. So I finished that series and Katie's like, look, this has got to be, you know, your first book. And so we, we went away together. I took those, used my vacation that year, took those sermon manuscripts. And that was my, my marriage book. Well, after you learn the, the process, then, you know, you can do it, repeat it, right? The yeah. most work comes learning what to do, but then after you know how to do it, you can reproduce it in other books. And so I'd, I would like to think if people didn't like one of my books, it, at least they couldn't say it's not biblical. I mean, yeah. you know, you can have, bring, bring <laughs> yeah. whatever criticism you want, yeah. but I don't think you'll be able to say that it's not biblical because they come from my sermons. You know, I poured my, there's hundreds or maybe thousands, I'm not kidding, hours of studying that has gone into these books and the marriage one, there's so many great passages on marriage, not just, you know, the familiar Ephesians 5 or 1 Peter 3 in the New Testament, but many of the accounts with the patriarchs in the Old Testament, whether it's Abraham and Sarah or, you know, Jacob and his wives, I should say wives, Rachel and Leah, um, you know, Delilah nagging Samson is a great illustration of the potential for women to wives to nag their husbands. So you start 
unpacking many of these accounts, there's an incredible marriage application for them. And so that's where my first book came from. And then the other ones, you know, I'd preach on trials, produce a book on trials, preaching on working and resting, you get work and rest, um, finances. I wanted my church equipped on finances. That's where my finance book came from. Amazing. And you haven't written on parenthood. I find that fascinating. <laughs> well, yeah, and mostly because I haven't, I mean, to be honest, Cam, I do want to preach on parenting in my church, not yeah. because I'm an, and this is funny or my son ironic. I don't want to preach on parenting because I know so much about parenting. I want to preach on parenting because I want to grow as a parent. I want to yeah. learn. I, I might even tell my church that I might come before my church and say, Hey, look, I want to preach on parenting because I want to learn and grow with all of you, you yeah. know? Um, so right now we're going through Luke. We've been going through it for years and I, maybe I'll wait till that's finished, but yeah, I'd love to, to preach on that and just dig out some of those wonderful truths on parenting. Look at some of the parenting accounts in scripture. Yeah. There's power in coming into it from a lens of not knowing. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah. And I'm learning, I'm learning with you. So that being said, as a father of 10, what is one area of growth or learning that you are excited about or diving into right now as a father? So it's in, how old are your two children? Nine and 11. Okay. So you're, you're a couple years behind me and I feel like we entered a new chapter with teenagers and there are some challenges, but there are also some wonderful, exciting things. Like my teenagers feel, this sounds weird, but more like friends. Mm -hmm. Some of your youngest kids that, you know, you cuddle with them, you love them, you play games with them. You're not having like super mature, deep conversations with them. You Mm -hmm. know, it's not to say you don't answer questions or have important discussions, but your kids reach teenage years. You're talking about mature things. You're dealing with difficult things. You're dealing with relationships. You're dealing with feelings. You know, you want your children to share their hearts with you. You want your kids to come and talk to you about, you know, attractions or, you know, you're talking to your boys about purity. And, and so it's just an, it's an exciting, challenging new season that definitely takes Katie and I and makes us feel, uh, you know, pretty vulnerable and humbled and needing to depend on the Lord. Cause we don't, you know, know what we're doing each day. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Very cool. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Scott, if someone wants to learn more about you, they want to uh, check out your books, your blog, your podcast, where can they do that? Yeah. Thanks for asking that Cam. Cause I, you know, this just flew by and I would love if people are listening, if they have questions or something like that, or I can serve them in some way, I would, would love, love to hear from them. So my website, scottlapierre.org, I'm sure you'll put the the yeah, link in the show, show notes. notes. Yeah. Um, they can reach out to me there. My website is kind of the hub out from there. You can find like my books, my conference messages or speaking information or my, my sermons. And uh, there's a contact page people can use to reach out to me. And I just want to say, I've got a, get, a free gift for your listeners. It's called Seven Biblical Insights for Marriage. And if you know anyone just goes to my website, they shouldn't miss it. it there'll probably be a pop-up or something that says, hey, you can download. It's a short read. You know, It's not a full book or anything, just seven insights that I hope would be an encouragement to people in their, in their relationships. Amazing. Thank you, Scott. And Scott, thank you so much for taking time away from your family to be with us today. I appreciate you. Hey, I appreciate you too, Cam, whatever, and what you're doing. If I can serve you in any way in the future, let me know. I appreciate you, brother. So God bless. Thank you.